Just how triggering are our phones when it comes to dopamine? Okay, great question. The thing about cell phones is when you first get on there and you have, let's say you're it, no Wi-Fi on the flight or something and you land, it can actually be quite stimulating. You get a lot of dopamine. Oh, there's this, oh, there's that. But very quickly, when you're scrolling on social media, you're no longer getting the novelty, but you're continuing to do it and you almost don't know why you're doing it. At that point, it shifts over to something that's a bit more like an obsessive compulsive behavior where we can define an obsessive compulsive behavior where the obsession leads to a compulsion. So the obsession is a thought, the compulsion is a behavior, but the acting out of the compulsion merely serves to increase the obsession. Our phones emitting blue light disrupt our sleep and affect our well-being. Andrew Huberman's research emphasizes this issue. Additionally, their constant stream of notifications and information can lead to addiction, anxiety, depression, poor concentration. However, awareness is the key to change. We gotta establish healthier habits and boundaries, limiting screen time and practicing mindfulness. Our phones are tools that can enhance our lives, but we gotta use them consciously. By finding balance between connectivity and disconnection, we can regain control and make technology a facilitator of our well-being. So, let's be inspired by Huberman's research and craft a healthier future. Right, this is very different than being obsessed with food or obsessed with cleanliness. There's no payoff. Right, exactly. There's no anxiety relief by carrying out the compulsion. With OCD behaviors, like scrolling social media, the dopamine quickly wanes and then you find that you're just sort of, and we've all been there, you're scrolling, like, why am I doing this? This isn't that interesting. That isn't, this isn't that interesting. Now, the algorithms that they've incorporated function on the most powerful way to keep people doing a behavior, or an animal for that matter, is intermittent random reward, a random intermittent reward that you don't know when you're going to hit the jack. So you're scrolling, you're scrolling, and then you see something. Typically, it's very high what, you know, in nerd speak, we'd say signal to noise. So if you're reading some interesting things, this came out in the news, this came out, and then it's all of a sudden a riot or a person that is jump, is base jumping off a building. But look, if something's very tragic, then that has this gravitational pull. And then you, what happens is you start getting the system working for that next dopamine hit that you don't know when it's going to come. It's just like gambling. So I look at social media as initially being very dopaminergic, driving reward, surprise, and excitement, but very quickly transitioning to something more like OCD. The phone is starting to gobble up all that dopamine and all that space-time, duration path outcome stuff, and we are wasting our cognition, and we're wasting the, the most precious gift we were given by Mother Nature and evolution is a brain that can teach itself things, and that can predict things, and that can look at the past, can learn from elders and gain wisdom. I mean, all that stuff is what we were put here to do. Phones, while offering convenience, can also be distracting and contribute to stress. When engrossed in our phones, we lose awareness of our surroundings, leading to potential accidents and injuries. Simultaneously, the incessant need to check our devices exposes us to a constant stream of information, inducing stress and anxiety. This overwhelming barrage of updates really easily overwhelms a lot of people, impacting our mental well-being. Recognizing these detrimental effects and establishing healthy boundaries with our phones is crucial. By prioritizing present moment awareness and managing our phone usage, we can safeguard our safety and cultivate a calmer, more balanced mindset. My dad said, I asked him if he thinks there are other galaxies, you know, because he's more versed in the in physics and the cosmos than I am. And he said, I don't know, but if there was, they, they probably extinguished themselves with social media because it's like mental chewing gum, people just kind of throwing away their cognition. And the dopamine thing, it's not that they're getting so much dopamine from using the phone. It doesn't feel like a big win. It's that they're spending it out, like spending you know $5 bills all day long, pretty soon you're broke, you're yeah. exhausted. And so I worry about our use of these devices and what it's doing with technology. But I also know they're extremely important. And the brain is essentially an engineered machine. It looks for where signal is high and above the noise. And so there really is a payoff nowadays, a short-term deleterious payoff, but payoff nonetheless for being able to recruit people's attention, recruit their autonomic nervous system, get those into them into those modes of having to click and follow and scroll. Now, I, I agree that I, I think social media, like for instance, I teach some science on social media. I've, I've managed to great, make great connections through social media, but we have to be very judicious in our use of it. And that's hard for most people. And what I think is gonna happen is we're gonna start selecting for people that are very good at controlling their attention, 
are very good at separating themselves from technology as well as using technology. And so for people that are just rabidly consuming technology and information and thinking this is the way to live a good life or to get ahead, they're actually just falling into the noise. And the people that are, I think it's one of the reasons why a select set of individuals have been so effective at controlling the landscape, the political landscape. Um, and I think that we need to think about whether or not we're in the noise or whether or not we're, you know, paying attention to these big peaks of signal and what's that, we're getting recruited. We're getting, you know, kind of groomed by these yeah. things. And it is scary. And at the same time, I agree. I think that eventually we will break through this. I do, because that's what the human animal is really good at. Andrew Huberman's insightful research acknowledges the detrimental impact of excessive phone usage on social isolation and the spread of misinformation. By studying the effects of technology on our well-being, Huberman recognizes that constant phone usage hinders meaningful social interactions, leading to feelings of isolation and loneliness. Additionally, he underscores the ease with which our phones provide access to misinformation, emphasizing the importance of critical thinking and fact-checking. Huberman's work serves as a reminder that we gotta be aware of these pitfalls and make some kind of conscious choices to foster genuine connections and seek accurate information in our digital age. And so, we go back to this example of a person that's not motivated, that can't get off the couch, that doesn't want to do anything. Well, this is the problem. We Remember the rat experiment? They are effectively the rat with no dopamine, but they can still achieve some sense of pleasure by consuming them excess calories by consuming social media. Look, I'm not judging, I do this stuff too, right? Scrolling social media. If you've ever scrolled social media and you're like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. It doesn't really feel that good. And so for people that aren't feeling motivated, the problem is they're not motivated, but they're getting just enough or excess sustenance. So they're getting the little mild hits of opioid. It becomes an opioid system. And if you think about the opioid drugs as opposed to dopamine, dopaminergic drugs. Dopaminergic drugs make people rabid for everything. You know, drugs of abuse like cocaine and amphetamine make people incredibly outward directed. Right? They hardly notice anything except what they want more of. More, 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 more. And it's very, it's bad because those drugs trigger so much dopamine release that they become the reward. It's very circular. The, only the drug can give that much dopamine. Nothing they could pursue would give them as much dopamine as the drug itself. There were little things that were super deliberate that just saved me time and energy. And then the other thing is I have really tried to adopt this idea that when it's inevitable and it will inevitably arrive, that stress grows us, that it really sharpens decision making. It really sharpens decision making. And, you know, if you have a very stressful event and then you recover from it, the worst thing to do is just go and keep going. You need to take some time and reflect about what led into that. If we are in a pretty relaxed state or if we are happy we generally feel like we can do what we want to do. We can maneuver through our environment. We can make choices that are reasonable. But oftentimes we're not in relaxed and happy states. That's just part of the human experience, obviously. And there is a fundamental feature to the nervous system, which is this thing they call the autonomic nervous system, which is just fancy nerd speak for the components of your nervous system that raise your levels of alertness or bring them way down. Sometimes we hear fight or flight, rest and digest, but this system governs all that but a lot more. And basically what happens is when we are at the extremes of the autonomic, what I call seesaw, of very, very alert to the point of being really stressed or panicked or concerned, or if we are very close to sleep and we're drowsy and we're exhausted, at those points along the autonomic nervous system, our thoughts become a bit like a runaway train. You know, if you're very upset, it's hard to talk yourself out of it. If you're stressed, it's hard to think yourself out of it. In fact, you can start doing all sorts of third personing and rationalization. You can call someone, you can text somebody. It's very hard to get yourself out of those states with thinking alone. Andrew Huberman's research sheds some light on how our phones can inadvertently become time-consuming distractions and costly investments. Hours spent scrolling through social media, watching videos, or playing games can be seen as a waste of valuable time that could be directed towards more productive things or more fulfilling activities. Moreover, the financial burden can add up significantly when considering the expenses associated with owning a phone, including data plans, apps, and accessories, and new phones, and whatnot. Huberman's findings encourage us to reflect on how we allocate our time and our resources, 
urging us to strike a balance between phone usage and pursuing meaningful endeavors while being mindful of the financial impact. We can make the most of our time and financial resources by optimizing our phone usage and reevaluating our spending habits. But the beauty of the autonomic nervous system is that it traverses the brain and the body and it connects to essentially all the organs of the body. And it's a two-way street such that certain behaviors, even certain patterns of breathing, etc., allow us to shift where we are on the autonomic continuum between very, very alert and stressed and very calm, and thereby give our mind a shift also in terms of the kinds of thoughts that we can entertain, the sorts of actions that we can engage in. To make this concrete, if you're very, very stressed, if you're very, very upset, two things happen. One, it's very hard to take your focus off whatever it is that's upsetting you. And if you don't know what's upsetting you, you know, pure anxiety, but you don't know why, it's very hard to take your mind off of the feelings of anxiety. In those states of mind, there's another component, which is that for whatever reason, and no one really understands why this is, it feels as if the state that you're in will go on forever. Now, when we're in happy, relaxed states, rarely do we think, gosh, this is going to go on forever. And yet when we are in these unfortunate states of mind, we get the idea somehow. It sort of hijacks our perception of time, and we feel like this is never going to stop. If we turn to the body and certain behaviors, let me talk about what those are, we are able to move ourselves along the autonomic continuum. And at that point, point when we've done that successfully, and it's actually quite straightforward to do, we are able to think about things differently. We start to get a sense that the way we feel might not be the way we're going to feel forever. And it's in those shifts that we start to realize, ah, my mind actually is not my best friend at these extremes, but there's a lot more to it. You're only getting the tip of the iceberg in those states. So that's why I say, if you can't control the mind with the mind, look to the body to control the mind. How would that be adaptive? How would it be adaptive for us to focus all of our attention onto the anxiety? Is that something that you could see a, a useful? Absolutely. So uh, let's take stress as an example. And this could be stress, panic, anxiety. You know, Each one of those has a definition in medical terms, psychological terms. But to be fair, no one really knows how to draw the line in the brain between fear and stress and anxiety. But we can say with certainty that all of those states involve high levels of alertness, high levels of awareness, sometimes for things in our environment and sometimes just for what's going on internally. Andrew Huberman's insights highlight the security risks and dangers associated with phones. Our devices store personal information, making them susceptible to hacking or theft if we're not careful. Additionally, distracted driving caused by phone usage is illegal and hazardous. Huberman emphasizes the need to protect our data, to stay informed about security measures. He also underscores the severe consequences of distracted driving, urging us to prioritize safety on the road. By being mindful of these risks, we can navigate the digital landscape responsibly and ensure our personal information is secure while promoting road safety. When we are stressed, anxious, afraid, waking up in the middle of the night, doesn't matter what triggered it, there are a couple basic things that happen to all of us. First of all, our heart rate quickens. That's kind of an obvious one. Fuel from our muscles and our liver is shuttled to particular organs of the body and away from others. In particular, fuel is shuttled towards the big muscles of the body to generate large movements. This is why we quake a bit when we're stressed. The hands will shake. It's preparing us. For, we are prepared for movement. Disturbing thoughts are something that a lot of people are disturbed by. But, you know, you go to an edge of a cliff and you know, what's keeping me from just jumping off? Right. It's the thought and the question, what's keeping me from jumping off, right? right. Uh, new mothers uh, report these really horrible thoughts. They don't like to report them, but they think, oh my gosh, what's keeping me from just, you know, smashing my baby's head? It's the fear that you're going to do that. It's like a break, you know? Okay. A lot of the way the brain works is all these reflexes. Mm. Uh, you know, to fight back, to say something, to harm things. That we are built for doing pretty much anything. And then you have this forebrain, the thing in the front, which acts as a break on everything. Hmm. No, don't do that. That's not appropriate for now. Sit still now. Don't talk now. Don't say this. Don't say that. Don't respond to that comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Right? yep don't yep. respond to that comment. Yeah. Right. And actually, I'll treat you, uh, teach you a good one around the uh, comment responsive thing. 
they'll save you so much trouble in life. So you have chemicals in your brain and a certain category of them are called neuromodulators. Dopamine, oh, yeah. serotonin, mm -hmm. acetylcholine, etc. Dopamine, people always think of as a dopamine hit, like it's pleasure. But dopamine is actually about motivation and drive. It's about craving. When you want something and you're thinking about something you really want, that's dopamine. When you're getting really hyped up, that's yeah. dopamine. When you actually accomplish the thing, it's a different set of chemicals. Mm. When someone comments something on social media or just says something to you, it opens up what's called, a, it's essentially a dopamine loop. There's this thing called reward prediction error, which is when we expect something and we want something and it doesn't arrive, you actually get a punishment signal in the brain and your dopamine drops below what it was before. Mm. So you walk in it, let's use a gambler as an example. Okay. They walk, not a compulsive or addicted gambler. Go into the casino, they're really hyped up, they're betting on a game, and their dopamine starts to go up. It's anticipation. Next time you go to Vegas, if you happen to go there or whatever, they're selling everything through this dopamine thing. Bitcoin right now, yeah, Ethereum, yeah, yeah. it's all about the promise of something. Gotcha. Yeah. Right? Value in the brain has, regardless of whether or not it's dollars, Bitcoin, Ethereum, doesn't matter. It's all about dopamine. It's a value system. The brain is doing math with dopamine. And then when the reward arrives, it compares the expectation to the reward. And if the reward isn't that great, it's a letdown. But that letdown is actually a drop in dopamine below baseline. Okay? Mm. Yeah. When someone says something aggravating or is trying to trigger you, it sets in motion this dopamine circuit. And when you respond, no matter what you do, it actually gives them a reward. It right. rewards them. Right. When you refrain from that, it actually sends them below baseline. Perfect. So exactly, <laughs> just exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah, exactly. Just stoic, you know. And it's hard to do, right? Because we get wrapped in. Sure. But so never respond. Right. Or delete it. Yeah. Or delete it. Right. Yeah. It's it's your account. You can delete it. Right. And so when you find yourself scrolling social media and it doesn't feel good, you're like, why am I doing this? Why did right. I pick up the phone? There are two reasons. One is that the behavior has become a little bit reflexive. It's sort of like if I had right now where no phones out, but if someone picked one up, we would all do it. It's just right. kind of reflexive, yeah. right? Yeah. That happens. But another part of it is that you do get dopamine hits from it. I mean, I saw that kid do the impossible 50-50 down the Oceanside Hub, and I was like, whoa. That's a dopamine hit. So it felt so good. And I didn't even do it. Right? right? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Imagine how it felt for him. <laughs> so then you start scrolling and you're like, what am I doing? Well, you're you're you don't realize it, but subconsciously you're seeking more of those wins. Yeah. So the best thing you can do if you actually like social media, if you like video games, if you like skateboarding, if you like your girlfriend, is actually take some space. Right. Right? Right. Take some space. Yeah. I mean, this is the new relationship phenomenon, right? Where you're just kind of buzzed out yeah. on just don't need sleep that's just pure dopamine release and then when people come back from vacation they're like oh yeah they're not that great that crash that's because it was too much of that and you're comparing what comes after to that it's all about a comparison to where you were before yeah okay so you just you don't have to be super anal analytic about it you just want to like, where am i at am i here am i here am i here and just realize that being able to go up and down through these different chemical states and mental states. But the real question, and I'm sure it'll be amazing, is what's he gonna do now?